is this your first HLF? Uh, no, I've, this is my second HLF, though I've been, uh, I came to the first HLF and then there was a break of three years and now I'm back here. You were at the very first one? At the very first one, yes. It was very impressive. Have you noticed any differences between then and now? Uh, not yet. I am told that there will be some differences in the programming. However, I think uh, so far it's, it's off to a similar start. The first one was very well organized and so is this. Uh, so I don't see that uh, there's a major uh, difference yet. I think some of the uh, technical ingredients are changing and the exact f uh, interaction patterns are, are being sort of uh, honed so that, uh, so I'll probably notice some differences as I go further up. But you came back, so apparently you like it. Yes, I definitely liked it. I mean, and the reason I did not come back is not because I didn't like it. It's just always hard to get away. Uh, and uh, somehow this time I just had to make an effort, commit to it. Uh, and I have to teach during this. I had to teach during this week, but I managed to find some other people to substitute for me. So this is working out okay. So what do you get from this? Uh, Two kinds of uh, things. On the one hand, I do look forward to the interaction with uh, young researchers. I do want to tell them, uh, you know, encourage them, give them tips, give them advice. Quite often they ask you very interesting questions and it's sort of, uh, it's always very interesting to hear this. Uh, a second thing that I do look forward to is a general outreach. I do think uh, some of the uh, research that we do is often conducted behind the walls of you know scientific journals and so on. You publish there but that's not reaching out to the broader world and I think one of the missions of the HLF is outreach. I appreciate it very much. Uh, in fact uh, one of the best things I liked about the first HLF was a visit to a grammar school over here. So I think I was seeing, I, I've forgotten, but I think I saw children who were in uh, uh, maybe ninth grade or something and I talked to them about mathematics and I got some feedback saying, oh, uh, uh, the teacher whose daughter was herself in the school said, my daughter has decided that she's not going to go into theoretical physics, but instead going to go into computer science from now on. So that was a win. <laughs> so I, I, I did en enjoy my interactions with the students then. I think uh, uh, some of this is, you know, I'm coming back for that. Now, uh, since you teach, you also, I assume, have some students who end up, uh, you become a mentor to them. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what that process is like and how you think it works? Uh, it's, uh, um, you know, uh, so I've supervised about 20 PhD students and so they are themselves faculty members, many of them now. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a slow process. You uh, are very initially. Uh, you spend a lot of time learning about what the students want to do, what they are capable of, what their passions are, and what they think their passions are. You try to separate the two. You try to separate. You know, people are sometimes over ambitious in some directions and under ambitious in others, and you try to sort of try to train them into saying, well, you know, these are kinds of things that you are actually very good at. Why don't you do more of this? Um, but the process is definitely, I mean, it's almost like raising a child. It's uh, a typical PhD student spends about uh, five years under your supervision. Uh, they're not working exclusively with one faculty member, not in my field. They would often talk to multiple people. Uh, with different people, you have to have different length ropes, uh, different length leashes and say, you know, you uh, should really just wander off on your own and do whatever you want. Some people really work to, want to wander off and you want to say, no, no, you, I want to hold you on a tighter leash to make sure you do some of the things that you're supposed to do. Uh, you spend I think a bulk of the time worrying about how they're going to perform and the last year absolutely thrilled with how they're performing and say finally I found a collaborator and this person is going to be great to work with and then they're ready to graduate and they go away. It's, uh, it's very sad. <laughs> Well, comparing that to the HLF, you only have a week here with these people. That's right, yeah. So I think even here, I was actually just uh, observing to a colleague over here that, you know, first day, uh, all the interactions are very tentative and we sort of, you know, are feeling each other out to see, um, you know, uh, is this, especially the young researchers are thinking, is this a person that I want to talk to? Is this 
in my area? Will they be able to tell me anything interesting? And as time passes, the second day, the third day, the boat trip especially helps a lot. You spend a lot of time with them. Over time, they start to realize that, uh, you know, they find the right people to talk to and you often have multiple conversations with the same set of people. Uh, I vividly remember last time we went up to the, uh, uh, the castle and uh, we were walking on the terrace and there was just uh, you know, a series of wonderful interactions one after the other, rapid but very, 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 uh, I think, uh, informative and useful and not just feeling each other, where are you from, where, what are you doing, but really more like, uh, what should I do if I, re you know, if I'm trying to do this and I'm stuck and you say, look, why didn't you try the following approach and, you know, uh, the approach might be talk to person X or go s look online, etc., etc., but, you know, for certain things, but, but these are very, very concrete pieces of advice and they actually, um, I mean, uh, they make sense to me. I did not get major feedback afterwards saying, look, I actually did this and this happened. There were a few students who went back uh, to their home institutions and wrote to me saying, you know, what about the papers that you spoke about? Where are the links? How can I find out more? Uh, some were even interested going a few steps beyond. But, you know, as with all the other things, you know, after a while, there's the usual attention level decay on my part. I, you know, two weeks into the thing, I'm able to pay some attention. Four weeks later, it's a little bit less. After a while, the conversation, the speed of the conversation decays to the point where it's almost zero. Uh, so uh, it does end after a little bit, but I think it does have, uh, you know, it does have influence, a lot of influence on a small set of people some broader influence, I would suspect, on a larger set. So think back to when you were around this age, 22 mm -hmm. to 27 or so. Right. Uh, what were you doing? What was that five-year period like for you? Um, I, uh, so during my PhD, I went through some fairly vulnerable uh, periods of time. Uh, it would be traditional for a person in my area to have a first publication uh, in their first or second year of some significance and uh, uh, a few more in their third year and you know pretty much bursting at the end of the fourth year and uh, I didn't quite follow that usual path and so on. I was at least delayed by I would think one and a half to two years and I was going through everything much more slowly and it was definitely a period where I said you know am I going to be of any uh, worth and am I going to be able to find this thing but what I found was very useful was that I'm always very interested in finding you know simple explanations for the things that I hear about and uh, this is a very risky strategy I mean you are supposed to go find one problem that you want to work on and try to do the best you can at it not look at 20 different problems and try to find simple explanations in each case who cares about that? That's something that may be worthy when you're senior. At this stage, it was not. But at the same time, I realized that actually this worked out. I mean, it, things clicked and things worked. And uh, I appreciated the value of my mentors, uh, my advisor, PhD advisor, who in fact, at one point told me, look, uh, in your PhD, you should be writing about these things, not those things, because this is where I think your perspective is relevant. And even as I was writing the thesis, things evolved, I got new results and new things happened. And so it was actually very, very valuable. So I think mentorship plays a very significant role. This is why we don't do distance education in PhD stage. Um, so, uh, and at all stages it matters, uh, I think, and I uh, appreciate all the love and, you know, uh, 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 nourishment of my uh, research that uh, happened through my peers and mentors and I'd like to give back in the same way. It's interesting you talk about this vulnerable period and I imagine some of these researchers are, are going through it. What advice would you give to somebody who's in that period? So uh, I think the first thing that we uh, try to tell, uh, we, we do it sort of in a cautious but gentle way of to make sure that the students' passions are really aligned well with the world of research. If you're passionate enough, I think you should just go ahead and pursue things and you should do things that you're good at. You should not do things that others tell you to do. 
Uh, so if somebody tells you, look, the right way to do it is to go read 20 different papers and try to find simple explanations, that person's probably wrong. That person is probably good for themselves, but not for you. On the other hand, if somebody else comes and says, okay, you're looking at these very deep theoretical things, but this is going to be of no practical use whatsoever, and this is not going to get you a job. Well, if your interest was in getting a job, then maybe this is not the right path to be seeking. If you want to get a good job, there are many, many other paths which are uh, easy to succeed in, but do not have the same level of uncertainty and risk associated with it. Uh, here uh, in the world of sort of, uh, I would roughly ca characterize myself as a, I'm not quite a pure mathematician, but I align closely with them in terms of my uh, passions and interests. And I would think, you know, we do the kind of work we do because we are very, very passionate about it. We nothing else would be sufficiently satisfactory. When you are at this stage, you really have to go ahead and do what you think is right. People can get you out of you know, local minima. You're stuck in some problem uh, and you're you know, having a hard time struggling out of it, go talk to somebody. That somebody might say, okay, here's something else that you can do for the next few days. But if you really come back to that problem and start thinking about it again in two months and then again in two months and again in two months, it probably means something. It means you really want to solve that problem. Go ahead, solve it. Don't throw it out. But at the same time, don't box yourselves in. It's always important to make sure you get good stimulation from the outside. You keep your main, uh, mental uh, capacities, you know, uh, well greased and well oiled so that they're constantly thinking, thinking about new things. But uh, do not um, uh, do not take any formulaic advice from other people either. To me, the most important thing is be, you know, try to, uh, you know, exploit all your uh, natural strengths. Do not try to imitate someone else. It's really good to hear all of these mentoring points though because uh, not everybody is as engaged same. with students as oh, you right. are. It sounds like that's really very important to oh, you. Right, it is definitely. Um, going back to your own field, what, uh, first of all, have you heard anybody uh, in the two times that you've been here who's caused you to look at it differently? And also, uh, what, well, these are two separate questions, I suppose, but um, what do you hope the researchers here who are in your field will go away and, and, and accomplish? That? Um, uh, okay, so the first question in terms of uh, have researchers influenced me to think about things differently? I mean, I definitely got a bunch of questions after my first talk over here, which forced me to think, think about things slightly differently. Uh, and it's always a, a tension between sometimes I think uh, I'm doing the wrong things and sometimes I think I'm explaining it wrong. And there's always, and finally there's always uh, uh, an unstated osmosis of ideas. You know, you, you slowly absorb what the other people are asking and you understand and appreciate it. So to me, every exposure does this for me and it's, it, to me, HLF is very valuable and it's in a, uh, the set of people that I meet, the young researchers as well as the senior researchers, uh, they're both unique. Each set is unique and definitely the combination makes it even more exceptional. So uh, I've definitely learned a lot, though I cannot probably pinpoint an idea and say, oh, this is something that I did not do then that I'm not. Things have been evolving. I'm doing a lot of things now that I did not do then. But I cannot say this is, there's a cause and effect relationship. It probably is. Now you've got me curious. What was your, your first talk and what was the thing that caused uh, you to look at it differently? Both times I've been very interested in, uh, I'm talking about theories of communication. So communication, uh, I think about computer to computer communication, cell phone to computer communication, human to computer and human to cell phone communication and human to human communication. I want an overarching theory which can capture everything. And the first time around I try to talk about uh, how is it that we would uh, describe the process by which say a child is uh, brought up and starts to learn how to communicate. Uh, and how do you try to build a similar feature into computers? You know, computers, you know, you turn a button on and it suddenly starts to acquire language and slowly communicates with its neighborhood. So I tried to uh, talk about it and there were lots of tensions, people saying, why don't you just do X? And, you know, why isn't this problem already solved? Or, you know, we have computers which do this. And so we had to, I had to articulate some of the things. Uh, it also uh, got me thinking about what 
is it that I could uh, try to do which uh, doesn't start you know maybe you know when, when t people think about language acquisition you can think about what happens uh, with a child growing up but you could also talk about what happens when you move from one country to another uh, when you know or when you start to talk to a new uh, set of people with, uh, from a new age group suddenly there's some linguistic changes some phenomena how do you uh, look at the mild changes as opposed to just the entire drastic ones. So all of these uh, different perspectives started emerging around that time. I don't know exactly which ones were before and which ones are after and which ones were influenced by the talk here, but some of them were. What, what years were you an undergraduate? Uh, I was an undergraduate between 1983 and 1987. Okay. And then did my PhD from 87 to 92. Okay. How would you say that, what challenges did today's researchers face in your field that, that you think you didn't or, or that, that you face that they don't have to? Uh, interesting. So uh, in, uh, on the one hand, uh, I think the fields are getting older. My field is the intersection of computer science and mathematics. Uh, computer science was much younger then and it's getting older, so many of the lower hanging fruit are not ripe for picking. Uh, the kind of thing, work that I did then used to be considered the deepest mathematical work in my field at the time. Uh, today this thing is probably taught in, you know, uh, graduate courses and the kind of work that people are doing on top of it almost requires, it will require five years of training to understand all the, the mathematics behind it, uh, not just to uh, explain the single proof. So a lot has, the field has matured a lot which makes it, uh, I think, harder for people to get into some aspects of the field. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, my field has become a lot more outgoing. Twenty years ago, the field of theoretical computer science was neither considered a part of mathematics nor computer science. It was really considered an outsider to both fields. Today it's almost considered an insider to both fields and part of it is the evolution of our field, part of it is the evolution of the others. But a, a theoretical computer scientist today is considered a lot more valuable resource in uh, a company like Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, in uh, an academic institution, wherever you, and you know, in academic institutions there are, I mean three of my students are now uh, holding joint positions in mathematics and computer science. Most of my uh, predecessors and I have only held positions in computer science departments for instance. So things have evolved a lot. Uh, there's a lot more acceptance of the, uh, of a lot more respect for our area. So I think uh, the students that are coming in, on the one hand they're finding the barriers higher, on the other hand I also feel that they will hopefully find a much better uh, uh, reception to their work, a uh, much broader reception and the problems have changed and that's part of the reason why there's broader reception. People have found the problems which are more relevant, more mathematically challenging, more better connected and they have been able to make progress on these and this has uh, greatly increased the respect for the area. I think the students are, uh, uh, are working on very interesting and exciting problems. They're coming up with one, they're very talented people in the field and so I think they, at the, uh, on the whole I think they're going to be in a lot better shape uh, than we were. It's just that we are occupying many of the positions that they'd like to occupy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we know the solution for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, well, I don't like that solution that you have in mind. <laughs> so we are almost out of time. Is there anything else you'd like to say either about the HLF or the students or anything? I just, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to this visit to HLF as well. I really am looking forward to the, uh, the visit to the school, which is going to happen again on Wednesday. And overall, I'm, you know, uh, I'm really um, uh, encouraged by the fact that HLF has decided to take this path, you know, uh, to bring the laureates and the young people together. It's good for the fields. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, the more uh, we manage to uh, put in some, um, you know, encouraging, uh, uh, more of an encouraging uh, uh, field we can set up for the young people, the more they'll survive, uh, they will thrive and uh, it'll, the better it'll be for the field, I think. So I'm looking forward to more, five more happy years. Thank <laughs> you.